first of all, a big, a big yashakech to the organizers, and um, uh, it's a schus to be here. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't, I was traveling, so I couldn't really hear what other speakers are saying. It's very difficult to talk when there's a fabrenging for ace to ace, and um, people shouldn't repeat each other. But I suppose, first of all, that they're different crowds for different times. And uh, second of all, if, if anything is repeated, I'm sure it'll be excused. And um, Something always new comes out. Um, I'm sure it was spoken about um, from the last Fabrengans of speakers that uh, all of the things that over the years the Rebbe let us know was Megala to us how what we can do, even though he's, he told us to Alts was irkent and he told us he's giving, giving it over to us. But nevertheless, he's given us many things to do, to do it, to learn in Yonagula Mashiach in order to be able to, to bring Mashiach and many, many other things. Um, and I've just heard the last speaker who spoke about uh, also very, very important in Yonim how to internalize and to live with the, the concept of uh, imminent disgalos of Nolech Mashiach. But ultimately, uh, there's no question that the Rebbe began to teach us how to live with Mashiach and how to, li how to live in a mindset in the state of Geula rather than in the state of Golos from the very, very beginning of his Nesias. As a matter of fact, I would say that for the first maybe 10 years, the emphasis was on how to live Geuladik in our own homes. Of Aratzto and Bote Chabad and, and uh, uh, outside to go into campuses that began later but in the very very beginning the emphasis was on chsidim, how to be able to change the mindset around us and uh, and the Rebbe did it in a very extreme way because it was so much against the grain of even the Frum community at that particular time and um, the first four volumes of Likut Sichas really is a, uh, uh, I would say, a, um, a derech, how to be able to change the mindset of living at Golosdik mindset to Mashiach, Mashiach Dik mindset, how to change the whole perception on, and how we look at everything. And um, one of the things that the Rebbe taught us is how never ever to be apologetic, never to be, try to, um, when people ask us questions, to be able to answer with stolz and with pride, and to call a spade a spade. And that's how the Rebbe behaved all the time. We never ever could find that the Rebbe was apologetic about any concept. I was thinking this uh, Shabbos, the Haftarah, was the whole story of uh, uh, when um, Dovid HaMelech decided to bring the, Mish the, the, the Oren to Yerushalayim. It was stored for a number of years by Avinodov. And, uh, Moish, and Dovid HaMelech is taking the, the Oren, and then when uh, the, the Agola, the, the Vogon, so Uza tried to hold it, and he was punished for it. And one of the lessons that the Darshonim find from this particular story is that it's not our place to be, so to speak, the uh, uh, people who try to find justifications and to uphold Yiddishkeit, to find Terutzim and, and to be the uh, apologetics for anything to do with, with Yiddishkeit. It was a, a story that happened in the late 60s. Um, there was, it was around of a time of a Pagisha. There was a Shabbos dedicated to Pagisha. And um, around the time, they always used to have different journalists who used to interview uh, Chabad uh, representatives and spokesmen. And a particular journalist, he made an interview with a, with a very famous Chabad spokesman. And he asked him a question. He said that he saw somewhere that when a person is Mechal Shabbos, he is Chayv Misa, he is uh, liable for capital punishment. How can we call a religion to be a, uh, a, a, a modern religion which is applicable to our days and not to be looked, up, looked upon as something which is very primitive and outdated? How can you say that in today's day and age, you take a person who's Michal Shabbos and he's Chayv Misa. So the uh, spokesman started to explain that in reality, it was impossible to perform. It's only in theory. In practice, it was impossible to execute anybody. 
And he started to explain what says in, in Chazal, what says in Rambam, that when a person was, in order for him to be executed, number one, there had to be two witnesses. The witnesses had to see when he act, they had to give him an hasra, give him a warning. And the warning had to include the fact that he's going to be killed. They had to tell him what he's doing is wrong. And a person had to continue, had to acknowledge, first of all, if he ignored them and you couldn't tell whether or not he heard them, he couldn't be punished. Only if he acknowledged the hasra and he continued immediately afterwards to do what he did, then he could be brought to Besden, and then there will be Hakiru Sudrishus, and it will be so complicated, one little discrepancy, and nothing could happen. So in order for the person really to be liable for death penalty, he has to want to commit suicide, he has to really know that he's, he's going to continue what he's doing. And afterwards, the Hakiru Sudrishus are so complicated that it could never happen. So he started to say that don't worry about capital punishments, it was only to show the harpkite of the Aveira, but it's nothing really to do with reality. Now, the Rebbe found out, I'm not sure if the Rebbe, the Rebbe listened to the actual interview or somebody told the Rebbe, but the Rebbe found out and the Rebbe didn't like that particular approach. And the Rebbe actually spoke about it by Fabrengen. And the Rebbe said that, that this particular speaker, Tzachabitzel, Tzatumult uh, Givorim, he was confused by the question and uh, he should have answered, said the Rebbe. It's, uh, the answer is right now in, in Yonah de Yema. They just now announced that the first astronaut, he went, the Americans sent the first person to the moon. And uh, the answer leaked to Dorton. So the Rebbe explained how you could answer this question. They said, can you imagine that how much work both scientifically and financially was invested into sending this person to the moon? The spaceship and everything went, went along with it. It was, it was billions and billions and maybe trillions of dollars were invested into it and, and the amount of training. And, um, and this, this person is uh, a, uh, a yochid representing the whole country. He said, could you imagine what would happen if as the spaceship is about to take off, this particular Austrian would take out a cigarette and light a cigarette? Would anybody justify what he's doing? Would anybody come along and, and, and uh, find any justification? He's not an individual person. You can't say, I'm doing what I want, it's democracy. Right now you're representing the whole country and even beyond that. And you're jeopardizing the whole investment into everything that went into it and the whole plan. So the Rebbe said that we are put on earth for also for a plan where there was a, the whole investment of Brias Oilomais was invested into each and every, every Jewish person. And when a, a, a Yochid, his Michal Shabbos, he can, he can say, he can come along and say that I'm, I'm, I'm an individual person, I'm doing what I want, but ultimately he's worse than the particular astronaut that is jeopardizing the whole mission of going to the moon. That's how the Rebbe put it. So the Rebbe wasn't into trying to, to um, uh, somehow, you know, the Rebbe, one time the Rebbe said that when you come into the car of a person, you don't teach him Dalad Misses as the first lesson of Yiddishkeit. You don't have to, in other words, you could still choose certain things, like the Rebbe said many times that our way, since the Baal Tov, is to, to madgish, asetoiv, not surmira. That's how you begin. So I'm not saying that, that you have to migala everything. That's the difference between migala everything and to use one seichel, how we bring the message across, in Eifel and Iskabel, but at the same time, when it comes to Yiddishkeit, the Rebbe taught us not to be apologetic and not to be, um, uh, and the Rebbe said it's not a stereotype of Israel with everything that we do. It's interesting that, that um, when the Rebbe said, at Moshim Sam gives them the shlichus, but they were already completed the shlichus, people started to think maybe now certain things are absolute, if saw him and other things. The reality is it's clear from everything the Rebbe says and, and, and taught us, that the fact that the the and everything which is remain is Kabbalah to Mashiach Tzadkenu, it doesn't mean for a second that anything until now has to be even an iota less than before. Everything we did as far as as, as far as Yiddishkeit in our homes, as far as Bimikar the Yidden, as far as Avaz Yisrael, as far as Tefillah, Torah, Mitzvahs, Davenim, Mifzoim, everything has to be on a high level, why on a high level, because if you are realizing that it's not just to Mekar of Yidin, but it's to, to Mekar of the whole world, to prepare the whole world. For his Galas and Mashiach, everything will be first class, not second class. And that's what the Rebbe taught us, that we have to go as first class passengers, not economy class passengers, not to do, try to find, to do things, um, you know, second class. You know, every person talks about the Mai Zohar Everybody has certain kind of a koch in what he does. One of the things that people who, Shluchim, that I work with know that one of the things that I, for the last decade, I'm, that I koch is that uh, to, to have a system in Chabad 
everything to do with Yuchsen, to do with Yehudi, with Yuchsen, when, when, uh, when people get married. And, um, and we created a protocol that Imir uh, Hashem it should be followed. And I always find that there was no God will be Israel who cared about Taras and Yuchsen by Yidin as much as the Rebbe. Who else was, uh, took to heart the whole, the whole uh, uh, Gzair of Mi Yehudi? And not just Mi Yehudi. If you look at Mi Yehudi, he's only who's a Jew. I saw recently a, a Yechidus which the Rebbe had with a certain Rosh Hashiva in Eretz Yisrael. And he, and he started to talk to the Rosh Hashiva about Taras and Yuchsen and about how important it is to be able to make sure that we that uh, the concept of Mihudi and, and Taras Ayuchsen among Jews should be on a top level. And that particular Rosh Hashiva told him that this is not my, my eagerness to, to Marbit Torah. And the Rebbe said, what is going to help you to Marbit Torah to a goy who is a, a bocher learning in your class? And people didn't understand what it means. It looked like the Rebbe is saying something which, is, which doesn't make sense. But today we see how much it makes sense. Today we really find people who are sometimes from and they think they're Jewish, but nobody checked them out. And as a result, how many people would take to the mikveh before they get married because there was a, a problem and, and it, when their parents or grandparents were miscarried after Yiddishkeit, nobody checked them out. So I want to tell a, a story uh, which I just thought just as, as I was on a plane and I was uh, thinking about what I'm going to talk about. I was reminded of a story that happened and, and I really bring it as an example because I encourage Shluchim that every single uh, couple that marry has to go through a proper bureau with the Besden, not just to, to be able to do a questionnaire because there's so many other things that are, you know, more than meets the eye. So I have a um, uh, that many Shluchim uh, talk to me from around the world about those subjects. And um, there's one particular German, him and his wife, they went to a place called Grass Valley in North California. As a, and they arrived and it's a, it was the first Orthodox presence in a whole of the shtetl, there was never ever, it was purely reform until now. And he called me up one day and he tells me, you know, I managed to convince there's a couple that started to come to the Chabad house. And these couple are not married to Kedas Moshe of Yisrael. And I convinced them that I should do it properly. So because we have to do it very, very carefully with them, I tread very carefully, very, you know, we meet, uh, um, you know, with uh, uh, sort of very delicately, as I say. Uh, so um, I told him, they asked me that his brother should be Misadar Kiddushin, he should be the celebrant because he has, a, you know, he has ability to be a celebrant. And um, we told him that we're going to have two kosher witnesses, we'll have, uh, we'll have a ksuba and a mikveh and, and, and a kosher reception. So I said to him, well, we'll discuss it. You know, he asked me to help him out how to do it. And I said, I said to him that uh, we'll talk about the actual ceremony. That's something which has to be adjusted. He can have a, a brand of Sadiq Edition. He can be MC, but we'll talk about it later. Let's first talk about to make sure that, that they are being certified that they're kosher to get, to get married. So he said, how do we do it? I said, they go to, the, to our website. If you want me to help you, they'll go to our website. They download a, a form, a, a, a wedding application form. They send all the documents, birth certificates, any Jewish documents, any cycle documents. I will interview them on, it, wasn't, it was before Zoom. It was, I think it was Skype or something in those days. And uh, it was pre Zoom days, whatever it was. And um, I said to, to, the, to him, and then, and then we'll, God willing, approve them. And then we'll talk about actual ceremonies. He said, you know what, I'm worried. We'll go to reform. Because they didn't sign up for that. They think it's going to be just a, a, the ceremony that they already thought of. And now we're talking about a whole, uh, you know, uh, peckled coming together with it. So I said to him, look, there's no braider. That's the only way it could be done. He says, yeah, that's the only way. I said, yes. So he said, you know what? So we'll do it properly. They may go to reform, but he prepared himself to tell them that's the only way he can do it. So he spoke to them. And lo and behold, right away, they agreed. So I get the file. Before I even a chance to interview them, I get the, the, um, the files. And I see right away that they both need a get. They can't get married without a get. Uh, he was married... Uh, conservative, very close. You can see that it was a conservative rabbi that could have had kosher aid in because uh, uh, you could see from the from the ksub and everything else. And she married reform, but the also needed a get. So I said, you, you, you want to organize a get? He says, what does it mean? I said, well, they're getting married very soon. It was like in a couple of weeks to getting married. So uh, we'll have to be able to, first of all, get the exes to cooperate. Each one has an ex. We have to get the, the, the ones that married before. Uh, when I interview them, I have to get Kviya Shabbos. We'll get them to uh, we'll have three 
shluchim from Northern California to be together with the two husbands, and two husbands will meman over uh, internet, uh, the our uh, bezdin to write the get, soifer, edim, shliach, everything else, we'll, we'll write the get, they'll send us kisul no, we'll write the get, and I'll oversee the, uh, the mesira over internet. So he says, listen, you know, there's no way they'll agree to that. Not only have, there's a whole thing they have to do, but they have to evolve their, their uh, the exes. I said, listen, you have, you have to ask. The worst thing can happen, they will say no, and then they'll go, they won't do it. But if you do it, you do it properly. He asked them, they right away agreed. And not only they agreed, but they spoke to the exes, and the exes also agreed to, to cooperate. The, 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 uh, the, the other husband and the other wife. So um, I conducted the interview with to, to do Biri Yuxin, which they really appreciated. They, they told me, and afterwards they told the Shliach, the Shliach is Nochum uh, Yusevich, uh, gave him permission to give his name. It's uh, only, I give him as an example to, to many, many others. He really did everything 100% correctly. And they told him that they felt that it was something was very special about it. The attention to detail, everything was done. He said they never had it before with all the other uh, type of um, ceremonies which they had. And after we were able to do a get and oversee the Mesira, and um, we also had to write two short psokim why we don't have to wait for three months in this particular case and why there's no Shaila of being Asura the boil, the fact that she lived uh, with a husband, with a future husband before she divorced the old one, why in this case there wasn't a problem. And uh, ultimately afterwards, I told him to break the news to them that he'll be Masada Kedushin, but the brother could be the MC and uh, everybody will think that he's the Masada. But the ultimate Masada was the Shliach himself. Everything was done 100%. They even liked the idea that we're gonna just uh, use an old ring that he gave her before, you know, we told them no, I buy her a new ring, and I said, "Look, we even have to buy, I have to buy new jewelry for my new wife." And every prat, they, they loved it. But afterwards, when the chupa took place, they um, there was a whole write-up in a local newspaper, which I received from the shliach, and the it was a such a kiddush Hashem, uh, both because it was the first halacha dike uh, chupa. Chasna in uh, in that particular city, but also the way that the couple uh, spoke to the journalist to interview them, and the way they were mekadeshem shemayim by telling them that uh, they could have just done a another ceremony the way it was done before, but they did it everything according to halacha, everything according to the way it should, it should be done, and it was a very big musa haskel that even though sometimes a shliach could be overwhelmed with uh, pressure from Balabatim. And I'm not saying that they should be chas v'sholem, any kind of a um, approach, uh, a negative approach when you speak to Balabatim. On the contrary, there has to be a, a there's a way how to explain everything in, in such a way that nobody gets upset. Even why there have to be, uh, why there has to be a beer, why there has to be a certification and checking the math. The ways in L'Shein is to say it in, in a way that is niskabal aladas, and at the same time, it creates only respect and nothing else. And I think this is one of the lessons that the Rebbe really pushed through. That when it comes to shlichas, when it comes to us bringing Yiddishkeit to others, we can't walk on eggshells and always be worried that if we say, if we do things like Pialocha, we're going to mirachic people, they're going to go away to reform, we have to somehow compromise things, we have to somehow make things second best. The Rebbe, the whole idea of shlichas was, and the Rebbe dedicated even in the, as I've started to say in the very first volumes, of the Kuti the Rebbe instilled and 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 uh, and put through this particular idea time and time again. The famous sikh about the Kedis Yitzchok, how he spoke about the fact that Avraham Avinu could have been worried about uh, what's going to happen to Yiddishkeit, how we're going to be able to continue after this. I'm going to make everything so unpopular. I'm going to do things so politically incorrect that everything that I worked for, I'm going to destroy. And the Rebbe said, that's not your job. That's not your job to think like that. You have to go with uh, with Bedar uh, Bedar you have to talk to people in the nicest possible way, but it has to be in a way that, that, that people have to see through that you are an ambassador for Yiddishkeit, for Chabad, for the Rebbe, and there's no room for compromise. Of course, you know, when I'm saying no room for compromise, Al Pialocha, sometimes there are ways, you know, uh, when I say compromise, I don't mean that, that you can't take sometimes a make a direction. That's 
what I do every day when I help shluchim, we're trying to find a solution in difficult situations. So I'm not saying that you always have to be as machmer as possible, but even when there's a cooler, it has to be um, something that the Rebbe would be proud of, not something that would be looked upon as compromising the name of Chabad. Like somebody once said, there's a difference between being a mekel and a kal, and a machmer and a chamoyer. So it's, all, it's, it's a different, uh, it's two different things. A person doesn't uh, always has to feel that I have to be machmer and ponimarain, something that, that will always uh, push people away. But at the same time, there's a question of compromising the Rebbe standards, uh, the Rebbe wants to conduct. And specifically in this particular case of Taras Ayuchsen, which is very, very intrinsically connected to Moshiach, because, uh, and I believe to the Rebbe, it was all connected. Because it's, uh, the Chazal tell us that one of the things that the Yonov is going to do is going to bevar the Yuchsen of Eden. The fact that the Shechina Shruya on Taras Yuchsen only when there is proper proper Yuchsen, all of these things are connected to Moshiach. But um, ultimately, um, I want to be able to encourage the Shluchim to be able to always go B'derech HaMelech, to go in a way that not to be apologetic, not to be embarrassed, not to always uh, worry and say, listen, how can I talk to him about a boss and tell him what has to be done because he might tell me I'll go somewhere else. Ultimately, Balabatim respect the Shulchim more. Ultimately, we see Matzlocha, like in this story that I told you, that Matzlocha was unbelievable. I just spoke to Shliach today to ask his permission to say the story. And he told me that they started to become Shabbat Shabbos and they started becoming Scarif in the most unbelievable way, this particular couple. So I want to say Lechaim to everybody that uh, all of us should, um, again, I want to finish off with what I started and I give a, a tremendous yashakeach to the organizers because it's something which no doubt will give a chizuk to all of us to be able to somehow uh, increase in this particular concept of, uh, of this very, very heavy and uh, uh, momentous task that have entrusted us. And uh, in Hashem, that the main thing the Rebbe used to always say that that's, uh, you, when you talk about something, it has no pearl yet, so this Dvorim, that's, a, that's an example of Dvorim Betelim. That our words should be Dvorim Betelim. Calls Mama Sheikh in the Kam, all of this is Dvorim Betelim, and the Yemit Hashem Moshe Bezeche to uh, his Galas of Moshe Yachtet Kenu, take it from Yad Mamash, the Chaim, the Chaim.